All right, as usual, what we'll do is we'll begin by allowing members of the panels to ask questions, <coughs> and then as your questions come in, we'll read as many as we have time for at the end. I'll ask my fellow panelists here to do one thing to help with the sound out there, if you would direct your voice into the microphone. They have trouble hearing us when we turn our heads to the side, so if we can speak directly into the microphone, that would be very helpful. Okay. Anyone on the panel? Dr. Whitehouse. Well, that was wonderful and inspiring, and we had some great talks uh, yesterday as well that focused more on biology. And I actually uh, wanted to just uh, relay Len's kind of uh, de biological definition of aging as kind of evolutionary, universal, uh, use the concept of molecular infidelity. You started off ta your talk bringing human beings more directly into it by talking about unique human characteristics. And one of the characteristics we have is inventing words like aging. So I have a very simple question. What's your definition of aging? Uh, and if you have time, what do you think it is malleable? What do you think the future of aging is all about? Mm. Oh. <laughs> How much time do we have? How much time do we have? Is that right? yeah. um, well, I completely buy uh, Professor Hayflick's definition of aging. Um, but aging, of course, is socially constructed. Um, that is aging in the sense of how we think about it and talk about it. What old age is is entirely socially constructed. Um, one of the things that I think we're doing right now is to try to accommodate socially, and not very well, um, this extended life expectancy. And what we're doing in the social construction of aging is we're tacking all the years on at the end. So we say we got all these extra years on average, and they're all going to be an old age. But nobody ever said all the extra years had to come at the end. They can go anywhere. So we can insert them into early adulthood, into middle age. We can stretch things out. Um, but it doesn't have to mean that we're all going to be old for a lot longer. Um, so. okay. Dr. Hayflay. <laughs> uh, I'd also like to thank you for Marvel's presentation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, Although you didn't say it, I would assume that most of the studies wherein you showed loss of uh, some aspect of cognitive function uh, with age, that these studies were all, or most all of them, I assume, uh, cross-sectional studies. Mm -hmm. I, as you know, probably certainly better than me, the dangers of cross-sectional studies as opposed to longitudinal studies I wanted to know whether you would be willing to comment on that criticism. I should tell the audience the dangers of doing uh, cross-sectional studies remind me of a cross-sectional study done in Miami, Florida, where it was determined that most people are born Hispanic and die Jewish. <laughs> That's, that's also one of my favorite observations about Florida. <laughs> uh, you're, of course, entirely right. And when you compare younger and older people at one point in time, you're comparing people who were born at different eras historically, people who had different educational opportunities, different nutritional opportunities, different environments in which they lived. And so if you find differences between old and young, you can never rule out completely that those aren't differences that are reflecting something other um, than age. The way we, we've tried to get around it in a couple ways, um, but I think probably most importantly, theoretically, is that we've done, tried to do this experimentally. And that is that we took a, a finding that has been reported as a difference between young and old in social preferences now. So what, what, who do people prefer? and shown that we could eliminate that in old people and we could generate it in young people in the same people by changing the experimental conditions. So in that way, we were, I think we were able to get around the cohort problem in that set of studies. Um, in terms of some of the other work, in the cognitive work, you're, you're entirely correct that we haven't been able to do that. We're comparing young and old. Um, we are working, however, from the theory 
the, the, the theory behind it is one in which we have been able to manipulate time and get these differences that are then consistent with the behavioral data that we get. We've also collected longitudinal data on emotional experience in everyday life. So we now have 10 years of data on the same sample of people over time. And indeed, you do see a decrease in the frequency of negative and a maintenance. In fact, what we're getting now longitudinally is a positive increase in positive emotions reported in people over a 10-year period of time. But it's, it's an excellent question. OK. Dr. Olshansky. Um, actually, I wanted to congratulate, congratulate you on a fantastic presentation. You dispelled one of the great myths of aging, of which there are many. <laughs> Uh, so congratulations on that. I, I wanted to point out that uh, yesterday I did actually comment on when we had survival time, and I said it's always at the end. Um, now, of course, what I was talking about was, was uh, survival time, actually living, and you're, what you were talking about was something a bit different. Uh, for those who heard sort of what would appear to be a discrepancy, there wasn't a discrepancy there. I wanted to, to ask a, a question. Um, about this conversation that we had and the two high school students that were back there earlier because this was an important point and, and I was sorry you didn't have more time to talk about it. I know you're pregnant and you're pregnant with a book. Anyone who's writing a book is pregnant. You, know, you, you gestate for a while, you deliver it, and then you show the baby around. You can only say things like this jokingly to a woman my age. <laughs> and it's a joke. <laughs> yes. So, and, and, and the topic of the book is one that I think is extraordinarily important, and of course the, the, the issue is, is that in the blink of an eye, as you said, we have experienced aging at a level that no species have, has ever experienced it before, and everyone here is, is part of that experiment, that grand experiment in the biology of aging. All of us are living this, and it happens so rapidly that we seem to be unprepared for it. And not only have we been unprepared for what happened during the course of the 20th century, we're trying to accelerate this process much more rapidly in the 21st. So what insights can you tell us about your, you know, where you're going with this book and this line of reasoning? Thank you so much for the book plug. <laughs> it you will have to tell inspire, us the title. It will inspire me to finish it. What's the um, title? The, ti the title is The Unexpected Years, and, it, and it's called that for exactly the reasons that Professor Olshansky is saying. It is, these are, we didn't anticipate this. Um, I think part of the problem in getting people to think about aging as something that is a crisis and sudden is because aging is as slow and steady as the day is long. I mean, there's nothing much more consistent, constant than, than aging. And so it's hard to get people excited about it enough to say, this is dramatic, this is a crisis. Um, but, but here's what happened, and I, th I sort of think we're forgetting, well, actually, I wish I heard you talk yesterday because maybe you reminded people that we didn't get this life expectancy increase by people in a gradual way. Um, we, it really is the reflection of an enormous amount of effort on the part of both scientists and the public to save the lives of the youngest members of our population, that is to reduce infant mortality. And it was around the turn of the 20th century where, where we threw everything we had at that task. So around the turn of the century, um, in New York City, 70 percent of infants had rickets. Um, you know, 25% of kids died before they were five. You know, it, it was, it, and what we said as a society is, we're going to fix things so that doesn't happen. So we improved sanitation, and we found ways to inoculate uh, children um, against uh, diseases uh, that were killing them. And in doing so, we inadvertently <laughs> created old age, or an old age. <laughs> uh, nobody was really, that wasn't our design, right? But suddenly we have longer, more, it, not long, I want to be careful here not to, 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 to get this right, it's not longer lifespan, but longer life expectancy. That is, many more people who are born are getting the opportunity to live out their lives. Again, what we're kind of doing as a, as a, as a society is saying the sky is falling, you know, <laughs> everything's bad about this. What we need to do now, it seems to me, and it seems so crystal clear and obvious. We need to throw everything we have in terms of science, technology, and cultural change at the second half of life. We need to now do for old age or the later years what we did for the early years. And again, turn of the century, think about what infancy was like. It was not good, infancy and early childhood. 
And people said nothing could be done. <laughs> Something can be done, it did, was done, and now we're gonna do, we need to do the same thing for the later years, and we can, if we have a sustained scientific and behavioral uh, effort. Dr. Selko. I wanted to ask you uh, something slightly different about uh, when I see my patients uh, who complain of memory disorders and uh, we ask them to remember things. And I think the, the lessons I've learned from your lecture are very helpful in terms of emotional content and positive versus negative uh, stimuli that we ask them to remember. But in any event, regardless of whether it's positive or negative, it seems that time itself during the testing is very important and that if you give older people a considerable more time mm -hmm. to perform, and I know this is something that's been studied over the years, and I want to ask you as an experimental psychologist whether that is something that is, uh, is unequivocal, that is definite, that old folks, if they're given twice as long to answer or to try to recall a set of mm -hmm. uh, items that have been asked to remember, whether they're emotionally positive or negative, will, will almost always perform better and will begin to approach the level of young people. My understanding of this uh, literature, and it's true in, in, in our laboratory, is that even with, with, with longer time, older people do perform better, and they do not perform at the levels of younger people on memory tests. So you still see an age-related um, deficit, mm -hmm. even with more time. So time doesn't seem to eliminate it altogether. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. We'll take a couple questions from the audience here. Uh, it's the idea of not thinking about negative things. Is this a form of repression, which may not be good for mental health? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there, there are a couple reasons why I think it looks like it's not repression and it's not denial. Um, is, one is that the older adults, again, much to the contrary of popular perceptions, have lower rates of every form of psychiatric disorders um, except for the dementias. So you see lower rates of depression, of generalized anxiety, of phobias, and so on in older adults as compared to younger adults. So in fact, in psychopathology, if you're gonna measure that as the outcome, uh, they're doing better than their younger and middle-aged counterparts. Um, but, but the other reason why I would say, even sort of in the, in the realm of normal, not having to go to psychopathology, but in that realm, in studies uh, that we and others have done in the laboratory, where we bring people into the lab and we induce a negative emotion, or a positive emotion. We've done a lot of this kind of stuff. Or we bring married couples into the laboratory and we have them talk about conflicts in their relationships. <laughs> Those are fun studies. Um, <laughs> when we do that, um, older people report the same intensity of negative emotion as younger people do. So they're feeling the emotion. The emotion occurs, um, but it doesn't last as long. They're able to do something to regulate it. Okay. Uh, here's, here's a question. Uh, sometimes what people say in class come back to haunt them. Uh, was, I was a student in your psychology of gender class at Stanford, uh, during which you discussed the impact of one's personal life, marital status, happiness, on lifespan and like, life expectancy. Does one's uh, marital status as a man or woman impact memory or cognitive processing in oh. old age? Oh, what a great question. Those Stanford students. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, no, <laughs> is the answer. We don't find much in the way of gender differences at, at all in this series of studies. And uh, as this student knows, I'm very interested in gender and the area of emotion is an area where you see a lot of gender differences, but we don't find any kind of age interactions with this. It looks like males and females are both changing in the same way along these dimensions. Okay, I have a couple questions along this line. Uh, does your research suggest that older people are less likely to respond to negative political ads? <laughs> yes. <laughs> ah, Absolutely it does. Um, and, and we're now seriously working on some, some um, uh, health-related messages. We're working with a health economist, Alan Garber, at Stanford. Uh, one of the things we want to do, and, and I should say a couple of folks who are great, Marv Waldman um, from Young and Rubicam, the largest ad agency in the country, and they're working with us um, to develop persuasive health messages 
that we can use to target older adults. And our thinking is exactly this, to say, you know that advertisement that they've got a fried egg and a skillet that said, this is your brain on you know, <laughs> drugs? <laughs> we think that kind of an approach would work great with young people, and that's who that ad is targeting, of course. <laughs> and we think it'd be disastrous with old people, um, that when you say something terrible is going to happen if you don't, that it's just not, picture, remember that, those brain scans. <laughs> the negative stuff is not getting encoded. Terrific. Here's what I teach undergraduates who have a, sometimes have a negative view of aging. Mm -hmm. How might I best advertise the positive aspects of aging? Hmm. Um, you know, I have found it very successful, um, a successful way to get younger people interested in aging is to talk about these experimental studies where you change the perception of time because younger people experience that too. So I end up, I teach a freshman seminar on, on aging and um, start with talking about relocation. They've just moved from their high schools to a college campus and you start talking to them about, were they interested in making a lot of new friends just before they moved from home? No, and who did they want to spend time with? They wanted to spend time with their family and their good friends. And then all of a sudden, older people don't look like another species anymore <laughs> to younger people, but rather, you know, this is, this is I, I get it, I relate to it now, and I think that's useful. That's great. Picking up on that, a uh, question from two younger uh, people here. Why is it that younger people have a better performance than older people? This is from David and Aaron again, right? <laughs> My friends, hi. <laughs> uh, well, one thing I'd like to say is it depends on what task. If it's the regulation of emotion, they don't have a better performance than older adults. But I think you're referring to these memory studies. So why do we have this persistent advantage that we see among younger people as compared to older people on these memory tasks? And as I pointed out, even on the ones for the emotional trials, you're still seeing younger people doing better. Um, it, but most people are thinking that it has something to do with the depletion of neurotransmitters, and it, it's something that's happening very gradually, again, across the lifespan. Uh, from the beginning in the 20s, <laughs> so you know, <laughs> so something happens much later, but from very early on we see this very steady decline, depletion of neurotransmitters, and, and most people think that that's what's accounting for this change in memory. So younger people probably have um, better biology there for memory. Okay, here's one final question here. This comes from an older person. Have you ever used a memory test designed by old people? Oh. The, the test you described seems biased towards youth. It goes on to say, older people simply have experience slash wisdom to recognize rubbish and to ignore it. <laughs> While younger people are subject to any kind of foolishness. <laughs> I am with you. <laughs> I, ha I think it's a wonderful idea to, to get older people to design a memory task, first of all. I've never thought of that, and I think it's fabulous. But I have argued with a lot of cognitive psychologists on exactly the grounds that you just described. That is, we, we bend over backwards to come up with words lists that are totally meaning, meaningless. There are some cognitive psychologists who make up nonsense words. Um, and give them to people in studies because they don't want it to have any significance at all. So we strip all the emotional significance of information and then we present it to people. Um, I was in a, in a workshop um, with the director of the neuropsychology and neuroscience section of the National Institute on Aging and she was listening to this about the, the results of this work and she said, sounds to me like older people are able to separate the grain from the shaft <laughs> and younger people aren't. You know, that everything, everything in it. I think it's probably more curious that younger people will remember anything that you present to them than it is that older people are being selective. <laughs> um, that's the thing we may have to explain, is, is why it is that younger people will do that. All right. Thank you very much. We'll, we will reassemble about a quarter to one for our next talk. Thank you very much.